Medicine has done a much better job making us live longer. And the problem is, as we age, our organs tend to fail more. And so currently, there are not enough organs to go around. In fact, in the last 10 years, the number of patients requiring an organ has doubled, while in the same time, the actual number of transplants has barely gone up. So this is now a public health crisis. The best thing about the Institute is that it's located in North Carolina. And the fact is that right now, uh, North Carolina is ranked one of the top three places in the whole country for biotechnology. You know, we started out with the field really being called tissue engineering, which means that you could actually take cells and create tissues in the laboratory for patients. But then the term uh, came on to become regenerative medicine, because really helping the body to regenerate. It really involves many different areas. You can use actually scaffolds, biomaterials. They're like the piece of your blouse or your shirt, but specific materials you can actually implant in patients and they will do well and help you regenerate. When you talk about Regen Med, you're really talking about the fields of biochemistry, molecular biology, molecular genetics, physiology, pharmacology, material science, all coming together to bring these technologies all the way from the bench top to the bedside. But I really didn't think about doing research until much later in my career, and it really happened totally by accident. The person that called me was uh, Dr. Alan Reddick, who was the chairman of our program in, at Children's Hospital of Boston. And he called me back a week later, and he said, have you thought about it? What is it you want to do? Would you like to do the research and the clinical track, or just the clinical track? And I said, you know, Dr. Reddick, I really have thought a lot about this, and I still only want to do the clinical track. Uh, at which point he asked to speak to my wife. She got off the phone, she turned to me, and she said, you know, I really think you ought to do the two years, because he really knows what would be best for you. Yet the current time at the Institute, we're working on over 30 different types of tissues and organs. And we are, use many different methodologies to create these tissues. For example, we can make them by hand, but we can also automate the process, and we automate the process by bioprinting, or what we call 3D printing. This is actually a desktop inkjet printer, but instead of using ink, we're using cells. There's a 3D elevator that then actually goes down one layer at a time each time the printhead goes through, and then finally you're able to get that structure out. Of course, we've now developed much more sophisticated printers that allow us to, to print tissues and organs. And the interesting thing is when we print these, of course, they have the same properties as you would expect in a normal ear. That is, we make them with the same biomechanical properties and elasticity as you would expect in a normal organ. And uh, same thing, for example, uh, looking at digits that we are working on experimentally. Of course, this is not in humans at this point. But again, bioprinted. One of the major areas of focus that we have at the Institute is also to create tissues and organs for our wounded warriors. The Pentagon has invested $250 million in regenerative research aimed at helping soldiers with severe battle injuries, regrowing muscle and skin for burn injuries, as well as transplant technology for lost limbs. And this is a program that we have called the Armed Forces Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is a collaborative project with the armed services and other multiple institutions to try to bring these technologies including technologies that involve tissue replacement for our wounded warriors. And at the end of the day, that's really what this effort is all about, is how do we create these technologies that have the potential to make patients' lives better. I, I could barely get out of bed. I was missing school. It was just pretty much miserable. I couldn't, you know, go out and play, you know, basketball at recess without feeling like I was going to pass out when I got back inside. It was. I felt so sick. I was facing basically a lifetime of dialysis, and I don't even like to think about what my life would be like if I was on that. So after the surgery, um, life got a lot better for me. I was able to do more things. I was able to wrestle in high school. I became the captain of the team, and that was great. I was able to be, you know, the normal kid with my friends, and because they use my own cells to, you know, build this bladder, it's going to be with me. I got it for life, so I'm all set. And how do you bring these technologies all the way from a concept all the way to an experiment that works to something that you can reproducibly do over and over again 
to the point where you get it to a patient and you can step back and say, wow, that really changed someone's life. We did our job.